If you're a college football fan and I say bedlam, you should have all sorts of thoughts and feelings uh, run through your mind and heart for that one. Even if you don't have a a dog in the fight, boy, this is uh, one that uh, brings college football fans together just to enjoy some good old fashioned hate. This is a rivalry that is unique in and of itself. But hey, if you've not been paying attention for everybody that inked in Oklahoma and Texas in the Big 12 championship game a few weeks ago, if you've not been paying attention, Cody Caller uh, commented to me last night and said, Mark, what is the most underrated, underappreciated, not talked about enough story going on right now in college football? And I started talking about something else. Then I stopped myself. I went, no, 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 no. Oklahoma State. Cody Stovall's here from Lockdown, Oklahoma State. You can catch him there uh, each and every day. Cody, tell us what you got going on this week. Uh, this is a busy week, brother. You know, it's we're, we're trying to bring as many legends back to Stillwater, Oklahoma for this last iteration of Bedlam. Um, so I personally, you know, I've got a pretty stacked deck this week. I've got some legends like uh, Tatum Bell and Reggie White and uh, Terry Miller. Coming on the show, I got Jeremy Smith, another cowboy great running back, coming on the show just for the buildup of this bedlam. And yes, it should matter a little bit more because it's the last one for goodness knows how long, right? At least the next eight to 10 years, we know scheduling, it, it, it is what it is. So this buildup, yes, it's it's been pretty magical. And I think, you know, I'll give credit where credit's due. Mike Gundy did have to find a way to get out of his own way, right? The first few weeks, he tried to overcomplicate things. You have arguably the best running back in all of college football in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and he only got the ball 19 times the first three and a half games. We have since found a way to go back to more of, a, I don't know, an Allen Bowman, Michigan-esque style of attack, and we, we've gone to some diamond formation. We found some intriguing ways to use our fullbacks and our tight ends in conjunction with some of the pulling guards and pulling tackles. So, yeah, uh, we've got a guy that's rushed for 262 yards, 282 yards, and 271 yards in the last three games. That in and of itself is an insane stat line. So every bit as much as Oklahoma State deserves the all eyeballs on this bedlam that is bound and determined to mean more because, let's face it, Mark, there's a five-way tie in first place for the Big 12 right now. We've got K-State and Texas this weekend, and we've got bedlam this weekend. So this weekend – will determine the the haves and the have nots pretty quickly and I'm I'm all in for it brother. This was about 3 or 4 weeks ago. Oklahoma State was hosting K-State on a Friday night I believe. Thursday or Friday night. Friday night. Yes sir. And uh me being me, I'm going to watch any Power 5 game especially. Nothing against the group of 5, but especially the Power 5 games. I'm going to be locking in on those and it had its own uh time window there on a Friday night. So I thought mm -hmm. I'm going to sit in on this one, see what this Oklahoma state team looks like because the last I checked in, not that I'm not looking at the scores every week, everyone I am and looking at the box scores. I do that with every team in the nation, but I had not watched Oklahoma state since a, a little bit against Arizona state, a little bit against a few teams here and there, but not really watched wire to wire. I thought, wow, they're they're only a couple point underdog here. That's kind of interesting, and and they've been playing such lousy football. And then I watched this game against Kansas State, and then I hear Mike Gundy after the game being interviewed, and I thought of you, Cody, because Mike Gundy he referenced them trying to figure things out the first three games of the season uh, at running back, at quarterback, some other schematic things that they were trying to figure out, and almost treating that like a preseason of sorts. And I thought. Cody told us, he told us, uh, this team's better than we thought. Well, not only that, you know, again, get, getting in our own way inevitably is kind of what, what stirred the pot. But that same interview that you were referencing, uh, I grew a little bit more love for Mike Gundy because he was actually pretty open and honest. Like he'd been, he started discussing after Kansas State about how he's now working 13, 14, 15 hours a day, which he's never done at any point in time in his Oklahoma State career. He's more involved with the X's and O's, especially from the, the special team side of the game, than he ever has been involved before. And let's just face it, man, I, I also thought that maybe our fearless leader lost some of his fastball. Well, it turns out the dude can still coach. He just had to be in the building and involved to, to do it. And I'm happy that we're at this point now. Of course, Yes, um, one of the first times you had me on your program, 
you know, I, I got a little uh, bullish on saying that we could win nine to 10 games, but it was because of the talent, right? It's everyone wanted to make a big to do about all the players that Oklahoma state lost in the transfer portal. Nobody really wanted to discuss the fact that only a handful of them were starters, but nonetheless, the numerical value associated with how many players we lost inherently meant we were probably going to have a lackluster season. But I didn't see that, man. I, this spring, this fall, I saw a completely different animal. It, it was a new look Oklahoma State. We weren't doing the air raid, traditional Oklahoma State offense. The run game looked good. Elijah Collins, the Michigan State transfer, had a phenomenal offseason. Uh, Jaden Nixon, the number two running back right now at Oklahoma State, had a phenomenal offseason. Ollie Gordon was up and down, but you all, all, already knew that he was uh, pegged to be a guy. And then the defense. The defense is what had me most excited. This Switch to the 3-3-5 as we watched with OU last year. Whenever you make this kind of a switch, if you don't have the guys to get it done, it doesn't matter. I firmly wholeheartedly believe that this is the greatest safety group that has ever come through Stillwater, Oklahoma, full stop, no questions asked. So were we going to be able to see it show up on the field? I think you are seeing that. Oklahoma State currently has five players in the top 25 in the Big 12 in tackles. OU, meanwhile, has two. So they're going to lean on Denny Stutzman. They're going to lead on Ethan Downs. Meanwhile, Oklahoma State gets to spread it out due to this 3-3-5 attack. Brian Nardo doesn't get quite enough credit. But at the same point in time, Gundy did have to be more involved for the locker room buy-in to kind of meet that, that full encirclement moment. Now, again, I don't think we're out of the woods yet until we win this game. This has been Mike Gundy's Achilles heel his entire career at Oklahoma State. And I know people want to talk about gunny derangement syndrome because of the bedlam record and i've said this before i'll say it a thousand more times it's not about the record i could give 13 hoots about the record the problem is like six or seven of those bedlams that we lost were for the big 12 title or the right to go to the big 12 title game so if you play for seven big 12 titles against ou and you only have one to show for it that's the problem i don't care if those were seven losses to baylor ucf temple or valdosta state if you play for seven titles and you only win one, it's more than just an OU problem. And I think he can exercise those demons this weekend. He better because it's the last one ever. And everybody knows, Mark, it's always the last one that leaves the sour or sweet taste the longest, especially for high school recruiting in Oklahoma. We just had a conversation with Parker Thune on the other side from the Oklahoma aspect and uh, he made that exact statement. He said, despite the disparity in this series and that Oklahoma has dominated both in recent years under Gundy and all time, of course, we know the difference in the mm -hmm. two programs. If Oklahoma does not win this one, OK State fans will always be able to hold it over their heads and say, we got that final one that kicked you out the door and uh, we have the, the final victory. Well, and this one's even going to be even sweeter because like you just said, most of the talk, even in the off season, was OU Texas, OU Texas. That's fine. I, I get it from a marketing standpoint. Them going to the SEC, them traditionally being the, the blue-blooded style of recruiting-esque that they bring in. I get it. I'm tracking. But if neither one of them end up in Arlington, oh, how sweet it is, buddy, how sweet it is. And if one of them does end up, then everybody in Big 12 country is going to cheer for whoever whether it's the Cowboys or the Wildcats or the Jayhawks it, it, or the Cyclones. At the end of the day, this is a lot of Big 12 together against two dudes. We can set that benchmark this weekend. Cody, when a team starts off as poorly as Oklahoma State and then they find themselves in the mix a few weeks later, we saw this earlier with West Virginia. They ran off some nice wins. They won four straight. When you really look at the wins, how good were they? But back-to-back -back against Kansas State and Kansas after a legitimately close game against Iowa State, that's showing me some really good football against some quality competition. Those were two enormous wins. Absolutely. And they were both ranked at the time. Uh, and then they're both ranked again now. So, yes, obviously it was a, a very big W. And Iowa State, you could see that we started to go back to more of that spring and fall-oriented offense, and it was it was working, but Iowa State's a pretty good football team, right? Who'd have thought that? Matt Campbell and Mike Gundy um, were arguably two of the warmer seats, right, after the first few weeks of the season, and now both of them are competing for a first-place bid in the conference. Not only competing for, they are currently tied for first place. I mean, the likelihood of a Iowa State, O State, Big 12 title game is probably still pretty 
pretty unlikely, but it could happen because we're both playing legitimately better brands of football right now. Hey, Cody, diving into this matchup a little bit more. Of course, we're talking Ali Gordon and the phenomenal three-game stretch that he's had. We've got an Oklahoma defense that two weeks ago I saw give up some big plays to R.J. Harvey in the UCF run game this past week. Daniel Hyshaw, Devin Neal. Uh, there's obviously opportunity there. How confident do you think that that run game can, can put up some big numbers? I feel very confident. And it's not, not just about Ollie Gordon, right? We can all talk about how phenomenal Ollie Gordon is. But the best kept secret in Stillwater right now is the offensive line, right? That was another thing that uh, I was with Gundy on in the preseason. Well, this is probably the best offensive line we've had since Joe Wickline. So you got to think 2010, 2011 style of days, right? And, you know, a lot of people were kind of confused because we had our starting left tackle, Caleb Etienne, transferred to BYU. And it was because of the freshmen that were pushing him. That's very valid. But again, the first few weeks, we were running three different systems with three different quarterbacks, and we wondered why the offensive line couldn't block anybody. Since we have gone to this more old-school style of attack offensively, our offensive line are doing precisely what Charlie Dickey was able to do at Kansas State, right, when Colin Klein was the quarterback. And that is get a hold of a guy, be responsible for a guy, and dominate that dude, dominate that, that area of operation. If you get to the second level, great. We were not able to do any of that the first few weeks of the season because of the, the rotation of madness. But ever since that has come to fruition, Ollie Gordon is probably good for, what, 130, 150 yards a game, maybe by himself, possible. But the other 130, 120, 150 some odd yards, that's because of the offensive line. Ollie Gordon will tell you that, but it shows up on film as well. Our center has graded out in an A-plus category four weeks in a row. This is the same center that was a career backup for four or five years. This offensive line is the best kept secret in Stillwater, and I do not think that OU's defensive line is going to have a whole lot of answers because you just mentioned some of the running backs that have been able to squirt free. Devin Neal, Daniel Hyshaw, phenomenal running backs, right? But they're not Ollie Gordon, and they don't have the benefit of the offensive line that I think Oklahoma State has in conjunction with what we've been able to do recently with the tight ends and the fullbacks and the diamond formations. It just it, it opens us up, and let's face it, Alan Bowman, Alan Crawdaddy Bowman, all right. He backpedals uh, a half a mile a game, but he also finds a way to drop some dimes in, in timely scenarios. So I feel good about the running game. I do feel good about the physicality. If we can open the gates with setting the tone and letting OU know this is not going to be your traditional bedlam. This isn't one of the times that you're going to have a lot of things hanging over us. We're going to be able to run it down your throat whenever we want to, and we'll be able to take the top off occasionally. We can set that mark. And I really feel like if we engage everybody in the very beginning from a physicality perspective, I think we can definitely get this W. You hit on the passing game. And again, what strikes me is kind of in line with what you're talking about with Bowman and these receivers is that, uh, of course, a lot of his negative stats came in the first few games of the season. But uh, the TD to pick ratio, the percentage is not going to wow anyone but they seem to be hitting for meaningful plays. It's not yep. five here, six here, seven there. It's, uh, again, key conversions, downfield uh, chunk plays. Absolutely. And the, the emergence of uh, wide receivers. So this is one of those things that I, I've been seeing. Um, does OU have the advantage of quarterback? Absolutely. Does OU have the advantage of running back? Not even close. Does OU have the advantage of wide receiver? Well, statistically, yes, because OU, I think, has four wide receivers in the top 15 of the Big 12 and a large, and a large part of your categories. That's partially because of Dylan Gabriel, right? But Oklahoma State has always been able to produce wide receivers. If you go look at NFL rosters right now, we're pretty littered with Oklahoma State wide receivers, so that's nothing new. And if you look at the emergence of a third-string wide receiver who was going to redshirt Leon Johnson last week, goes off for a buck 50. That just goes to show that Oklahoma State may not have all the fancy numbers that some of the OU receivers have at the moment, but when it comes to footwork, route running, and disciplinary ways to get the, the defensive backs to manipulate their eyes and their hips to do what you want them to do, Oklahoma State is still one of the top wide receiver producing programs in the United States of America. This should be a good time for us to put that on full display. You're right. We're not going to pass it all up and down the field like the Brandon Whedons and, and Mason Rudolphs. That's not a necessity. We need more of a Trent Dilfer. We need more of an Alex Kate, somebody that can manage the game, 
take care of Ali when necessary, and hit the big plays whenever they're available. And that's what we've been able to do the last uh, last five games. Cody, as you well know, even though, like you say, the Oklahoma wide receiver room has produced better than I anticipated in many people, it's come together pretty well. Dylan Gabriel has nice numbers, uh, really was throwing the ball well early in the year. The last few weeks, he's really turned into more runner than quarterback or right. passer, I should say. Uh, your thoughts about Oklahoma State uh, standing up to what he provides both in the run and the pass game? Well, it's going to be difficult, right? As anybody knows that if you have a mobile quarterback, that's an extra person that you have to account for. And for and it's all about numerical advantages, right? Whether you go to the short side of the field or the wide side of the field, you're trying to gain numerical advantages. When you have a mobile quarterback, you're always going to be able to put yourself in a position to typically have those numerical advantages. Now, the other side of the coin is, you're right. He hasn't been putting up the gaudy numbers that he was putting up at the beginning of the season. Obviously, that has something to do with the schedule. But another part of that is, you know, we're, we knew we were going to have conversations about Houston and Cincinnati and UCF not having the two deep right to compete all year in the gauntlet that is the Big 12. If you want to look at OU's depth, I don't know that it's that drastically different, right? I, I know that everybody likes to talk about all the stars that OU brings in. But when they've had to reach into their bag of depth this year, it hasn't been a thing of beauty. That's the exact opposite of Oklahoma State. We've got a bunch of freshmen and, and underclassmen that have inevitably needed to step up and play, and they've been able to produce big numbers. So I would say that the second deep at Oklahoma State might be better than OU's, and I think that's pretty evidentiary when you look at the statistics over the last few games, especially with, with Dylan Gabriel's drop-off. Cody Stovall, Locked On Oklahoma State. Please join him there. You see his Twitter handle as well. And uh, please follow Cody. It's a good time, and you'll want to lock in, especially this week. It's bedlam. It's serious. It means something. It always means something because there's pride involved. But this year, first place is on the line in the Big 12. Uh, if, if I was going to point to one big concern in this game, and then one place where you think Oklahoma State can really take advantage, what would those two things be? The biggest concern is always the same as every year for me, and that is, is Mike Gundy going to be aggressive or is he going to go into his conservative bag mode? That seems to be the common consensus every year with Bedlam, right? I've made reference to it's like the water boy when the coach looks at the other sideline and sees the opposite coach as a big baby head, right? That's what Gundy needs to get to because – his entire career, every time he looks over at that other sideline, whether it be Bob Stoops or Lincoln Riley, he finds a way to go in this little internal shell, and he gets punt happy or field goal happy or takes knees with two minutes left going into halftime. That stuff is always a concern. It's a major concern in this game as well because if you caught his most recent press conference, he once again said it's just another game. He even said the K-State game was more important. I wanted to throw my daggone laptop across the hall, but it is what it is. That is the biggest concern for me. It's not the players. It's not the athletes. It's not the dudes. It's is Mike Gundy going to go into his conserva mode again? That's cost us so many bedlams. I just want to see him throw caution to the wind, right? All gas, no brakes, leave no quarter, leave no walking wounded alive. If this is the one time that Mike Gundy decides to step on a jugular and shoot for 100 points, I'm all for it. Now, the other side of the coin where I think we, we might have an advantage that nobody's really talking about, and it is the secondary. Oklahoma State hasn't really been viewed as a very good secondary this year because the games that we've been able to shut down the run, we've given up three, four, five hundred 500 yards almost through the air, right? So you can see that there's some susceptibility on the back end of the defense, but at the same time, I think that our talent level and our, our athleticism and size – is going to be a problem. I just I, I just feel like this is the game where it kind of all comes together for those back-end safeties. Cody, we appreciate you stopping by, and we encourage everyone to head on over to uh, Lockdown Oklahoma State. Do you have a podcast that uh, uploads at a particular time? Um, I traditionally try to upload my my regular show around noon, one o'clock Central Standard Time, typically. Um, and then what we've been going live from downtown Stillwater a little bit this week. I'm going to go live a couple more times this week simply because I've got some of those some of these Oklahoma State legends coming on the show. So I like to get some of the fan interaction, obviously. Um, 
but yeah, man, I, I do a daily daily show, Locked On Oklahoma State. You can find me on, on Twitter. I, I try to stay pretty engaged and pretty active. O State all day on Facebook. O State all day on Twitter is or uh, Instagram as well. But uh, yeah, man, just 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 grinding through this season that started pretty uh pretty pitifully. But yeah, we've caught fire, and the excitement in the locker room is different than I've ever seen before. You know what I mean? It's you you know just covering the sport, the opportunity to get the locker room to re-engage. Like usually when you lose a locker room season's done and over with, we watched it last season at Oklahoma state. The, the chances that a locker room can kind of re galvanize mid season. you got like a 10% chance of that ever working. Right? So the fact that we've been able to do this internally and it permeate to the coach's office. Again, these players are seeing Mike Gundy and staff with their coach's office lights on at 10 o'clock at night. 11 o'clock at night, midnight. The only other coach that you saw that happen at Oklahoma State was Jim Knowles. Jim Knowles was that kind of quirky guy that would stay up till midnight in his office and, and hammer away at stuff. Now you got Mike Gundy do it. You got Casey Dunn doing it. You got Tim Rattay doing it. You got Brian Naro doing it. The players are feeding off of what they started. And to me, that the culmination of all of that will be Bedlam. If Mike Gundy lays another dud here, then it's back to the same old, oh, great, it's the, here's the Bedlam record once again. I don't want to see it. Nobody else wants to see it. It's the last one possibly ever, at least for the next decade. I just want that our players to know that it means more than Mike Gundy pretends in his press conferences. And I hope Mike Gundy know it means more than he leads on in his press conferences. And I hope we see the play calling and the aggressiveness that match that. Appreciate it, Cody. Absolutely, Mark. It's a pleasure, as always. Thank you very, very much for your time, sir. I greatly appreciate uh, what you do and for having me on.